Hello, one and all. This is my view of a sentence bookworm, part five, volume two. And I gotta say, I think this might be my favorite volume of the series so far. I mean, seriously, when I first opened and saw there was a headache-inducing report chapter, I was honestly tempted to just skip the entire volume and just go right to that. I love those short stories. I love headache industry reports, but I didn't, and I'm so glad I didn't, because every chapter of this volume was amazing. I mean, seriously, even the prologue can almost be considered a headache inducing report as we get Ferdinand reacting to mine's reports. <laughs> Many of which start off with, hey Ferdinand, are you taking care of yourself? Are you eating well? Are you resting? You're not working too hard, right? Which is a little embarrassing, because mine probably didn't realize those reports would be read out loud by his scholars in his office. Oh god, poor Ferdy. Poor, poor Ferdy. But you know, he's a pretty good liar. You can probably sell this more as, you know, oh, that is our saint of Aaronfest who cares even for orphans, even for the like of me, uh, rather than, you know, him being just fully incapable of taking care of himself and living a very unhealthy lifestyle. Love it. But anyway, though, what I really, really love about this chapter was Ferdinand's plan to basically sabotage mine to keep her out of the archives since he knows that the key to the magic Bible can be found down there. And it's, you know, definitely interesting he's so certain of that. He doesn't say, like, oh, if she goes down there, she might find it, or oh, there's probably a clue down there. He seems utterly and completely convinced that the magic Bible's key is down there. So, Ferdinand, what do you know that we don't? Very, very interesting. Uh, anyway, though, his plan is basically to give mine super suspicious information about the archives so that she can give that to the royals, who will know they're communicating, will stop trusting her, and will give her key to the library to somebody else. A pretty good plan for the Lord of Evil. Unfortunately, though, this plan fails to consider just how utterly and completely desperate the royals are, and how stupid they are, as they have literally nobody else who can take on the role of key holder, so even after mine outright insults them, basically saying, what the freak are we doing here when we could be at the goddamn library, they still bring her to the library, they still give her a key, they still take her down to the archives, and when she says, oh, I can't go in because my guardians made me promise I wouldn't, Anastasia literally drops a royal decree ordering her to enter. And while this shock shocks Sigi, I love that Annie knows her so well. He's like, okay, she wants to come in, she wants to help, she wants to read these freaking books, so let me just give her an out so she can actually do it. That is honestly kind of an adorable scene right there, and I love it. Though the scene is fully reliant on Anastasia and Sigi being fairly incapable of reading the old dialect, so, I mean, like I said, they're kind of stupid. And then, when they're done for the day, after they've literally dragged mine out of the archives, they tell her they won't go back anytime soon because they're just so, so busy. Which seems like an insane line, considering what's at stake, but makes way more sense when you realize that Prince Ziggy is somehow way, way worse than Annie. I actually really liked him this volume. I mean, he seemed pretty laid back and relaxed. But then I read the short stories, uh, the side stories, and good freaking lord, he fully and completely believed everything Rowlett said about mine, even when he didn't actually understand it, and he actually freaking said that he didn't even want slash need the magic bible, since his dad's done fine without it, and just what the freak are you talking about? Your father is literally drowning in potions, and half the country calls him an illegitimate, illegitimate king, and you think that's an okay way to rule? I mean, I was honestly tempted to say, okay, let's give the throne, the throne to Anastasius, but then he actually freaking said that Ferdinand was probably helping them because he's just so grateful they got him to marry into an upper-ranked duchy. Good lord. I mean, thank God mine wasn't around to hear that, or she'd have probably killed him. So that just leaves Hildebrand, the one true king. And I actually do love this kid. It was so overwhelmingly adorable when he pouted after not being allowed into the archives and mine cheered him up by promising to stay behind and have tea with him. <laughs> oh my god, I absolutely love that. Especially since Hildebrand's retainer gave mine a little nod like, thank you, thank you so much for dealing with his temper tantrum. <laughs> adorable, absolutely adorable. And, oh god, when I talk about this illustration, I mean seriously, this... This door, the archive, it is just so massive, so intimidating, so honestly alien compared to everything else we've seen in this series. And God above, it is so awesome. It's one of my favorite illustrations ever. 
<laughs> and also, this is the first time we've really seen Weiss and Shorts all dressed up and dapper in full color. And I do love the size comparisons between them and mine. She is so freaking tiny. <laughs> utterly, utterly adorable. Anyway though, then it's time for Ditter research. And after mine attempts to replicate the weird ritual the Ditter does to, you know, pump themselves up before battle, using the actual spear of Liedenschaft, surprise, surprise, the results are a bit stronger than when just waving around a normal spear. In fact, she produces a giant rainbow explosive blessing that makes everyone so strong they are fully incapable of actually playing Ditter. Except for Tragat, who is surprisingly okay. I'm not sure if this is because mine hates him, so we got less of a blessing, or if he's just, you know, so much more skilled than everyone else. But either way, he did actually listen to Matthias when he warned him, if you launch that attack, you're gonna kill people. So, you know, that's something he's doing better, I guess. But he also, mine's blessing produced a strong blue light, which is probably linked to the two lights she produced last volumes when learning the names of the two supreme gods. And then all throughout this volume, she kept adding to that list. Red for the dedication ritual, green when healing, yellow with the windshield, and white with the god of life sword. Which means, unless I'm wrong, mine has now shot a light related to every one of the major gods, which I definitely find suspicious, and I'm sure this will lead to her unlocking something cool next volume. I mean, this is where a video game be like, you've done it, you've activated all the god blessings, now a secret pathway has unveiled itself, blah blah blah, something like that. Anyway though, then it's time for the cousin's tea party with Detland, and as weird slash painful as it is for me to say, I honestly and truly feel bad for this girl. Yes, she's an egotistical idiot, and we all hate that Ferdinand has to marry her, but that wasn't her fault. It wasn't her choice. In fact, she already had someone she was in love with and wanted to marry, but as a future Archduke, she had to marry an Archduke candidate. Except... She's not even the next Archduke. She's the interim Archduke until Letizia comes of age. That's what the king decreed, and literally everybody knows it except for Detland. Even her own freaking retainers, but nobody's bothered to tell her. Heck, the scholars even said the last Archduke purposely avoided educating her so that Letizia would have an easier job taking over. Jesus Christ, that is an insanely stupid plan. I mean, I know this dude probably wasn't planning on dying so soon, but Letizia is freaking seven, meaning the duchy is going to have to suffer years and years under Detland. I mean, yes, Ferdinand's probably supposed to, you know, take over for her, but there's only so much he can do as the husband of an archduke, interim archduke, whatever. Though, I'm also not actually sure if anybody's bothered to tell Detland that her father died. I mean, when she's talking about him, she says he certainly can't be described as well, which would be an incredibly cold way of referring to her own dead father. And while I think she would say something like that, I don't know if she'd be clever enough to actually do so. So, she's clearly being kept in the dark, and even the fact that she has not asked a single question about Aaronfest, it's also pretty clear that she is probably not aware of Georgie's plan to take over the duchy, or the purge they did to stop her. So, yeah, Detlin might suck. Detlin absolutely does suck. But she's genuinely one of the most tragic characters in this series. Intentionally kept dumb by everyone around her to keep her in the dark and keep her from holding on to the power that they promised her. The power they told her was the birthright. The power that she sacrificed her love to obtain. The power that she married a man 11 years older than her to obtain. That is just overwhelmingly tragic. But that said, Detland is certainly annoying, and mine doesn't really feel any sympathy for the woman who she feels took Ferdinand away from her, and doesn't even appreciate him. So she's in a pretty ticked off state, and it doesn't help that literally every freaking tea party she goes to is the same. Lower and real rank, middle rank duchies begging to join the joint research, while at the same time repeatedly insulting and mocking both the temple and Sylvester for forcing mine to work in the temple. And no matter how many times Mine tries to defend him, they just completely ignore her, viewing her as a weak-minded saint who exists as a puppet for her guardians. So eventually she snaps. 
but she does it in the best way possible, a way that shows how much she really has grown. She doesn't crush, mock, insult, or threaten anyone. Instead, she's using everything she's learned from being a noble to make everyone happy, while still punishing those greedy middle and lesser duchies who seek nothing but personal gain, speak ill of my adoptive family, mock rituals to no end, and refuse to listen to anything I say. Oh, this girl's mad, and I absolutely love it. Also, love Yarda actually being shocked that mine has become so good at masking her own anger to the point that even her retainers barely noticed it. And while she also warns her not to let the anger and hatred cloud her judgment, what mine did was probably one of the smartest moves she's ever made in this series, as letting the middle and lesser duchies join her in conducting a dedication ritual at the academy kind of helped everyone. I mean, yeah, it was certainly a big headache for Aaronfest, so much so that Florentia literally passed out when she read the report, and the lesser mill duchies kind of went bankrupt trying to forward the cost of potions needed to play treasure-stealing ditter to qualify. The benefits definitely outweighed those costs. I mean, Aaronfest got a huge boost in reputation from this, and people clearly seeing that Wilfried and Charlotte actually do help in the temple. The duchies who participated were not only credited on the joint research, but were personally thanked by the king, almost bringing some of them to literal tears, and they got to earn prayer experience and unlock some divine protections down the road. And then the Ditter Duchy. I mean, they got more practice granting blessings for a match, and got to play treasure-stealing Ditter against most of the duchies. I mean, heck, they were so thrilled that they held a party in Mine's honor in their dorm. And honestly, I think Mine might be more popular in the Ditter Duchy than in Aaronfest. Which certainly makes the big fight this volume way more interesting. And meanwhile, the royal family got a bunch of mana all at once that'll be super helpful in supporting the country as a whole. And honestly, I think the biggest victims of this were Mine and those that didn't get in. Mine, because she got a reputation as an actual literal goddess, got really sick, and had her plan backfire as the royals were too busy spending their new mana to actually take her back to the archives. <laughs> oh, I love it. And as for those who weren't part of this, I mean, that's technically two separate groups. First is the duchies that didn't participate. Definitely Imberduke, since they couldn't afford the duchy games, even though they were the ones who were begging most to be part of this. And, you know, quite a few others as well. They're going to be in the minority that didn't support the royal family. <laughs> and that is not going to look good when it comes time to decide ranks for the year. <laughs> oh boy. Though they're probably in a better state than those who were deemed too dangerous to enter, because unsurprisingly, you can't have guard knights at religious ceremony, but you also can't leave the king unprotected. So mine used her windshield basically as a bouncer. <laughs> and I love this was tested by having a dozen burly knights try and fail to beat up this little girl. <laughs> that is an absolutely hilarious image. And then mine healed the knights who attacked her and gave them potions, further signifying her role as a saint. But anyway though, uh, while this was a good plan to keep everybody safe, I don't think mine predicted the potential backlash here of people being deemed malicious towards the royal family. I'm assuming the Arnsbach students, you know, just really hated mine, and mine tried to explain that, but it's still not a good look for them, and could have some real consequences. With that being said, the king clearly knows that people aren't happy with how he's ruled the country, so he's not particularly surprised that some students might hate him and want him dead. Still though, I'm curious this will come up again. I mean, the knights did say that the suspects would have a chance to prove their innocence, and honestly, they might have viewed this as a good chance to identify potential threats moving forward, so very interesting. But anyway though, the ritual is success, and they actually produce so much more mana, there's enough left over to give to the library's foundation, which was on the verge of running out. And that is rather concerning, since if this foundation is similar to the foundation of an actual duchy, that would mean, you know, if it runs out of mana, the library just kind of falls apart, including the archive with all the ivory tablets in it. So, yeah, that'd be bad. That'd be so overwhelmingly bad. We then get Clarissa and Hartman gushing over their love for mine. God, I love these two. And unsurprisingly, mine ends up bedridden for two days after drinking two recovery potions and summoning five divine instruments throughout the day. Was it five? Wait. Uh, windshield, healing, windshield, chalice, healing, okay, a five. And though honestly, it's kind of impressive that she actually made it to bed instead of just collapsing partway through the day. I mean, she's definitely doing better. I think this is a really good sign. And though, once she's recovered, it's time to negotiate with Leslet over his illustrations. 
and mine really shows your merchant spirit here, fighting back against his demands and being completely willing to walk away from the table if the conditions aren't right, all while Wilfrey is screaming in the background, we need the illustrations, we need the illustrations! <laughs> and this is the point where Lester decides that mine belongs in the Ditter Duchy as his wife, and he's not entirely wrong. Mine has a warrior spirit and doesn't back down, no matter who she's up against, while Aaronfest does not, like, at all. I mean, I think this was made very clear in the epilogue, where Lestalot kept mocking slash antagonizing Anastasius, despite him kind of being in the wrong, while Wilfried, who was more in the right, just kind of hung his head and meekly accepted everything the prince said, despite probably being upset about this. I mean, that's not the Dittoduchi way, and that's not how mine would have reacted in this situation. And honestly, despite Lestalot being a jerk here, I can't really disagree with much, uh, much of what he said. I mean, he saw mine's true value. Not just, you know, her mana, he saw her skills, her creativity, her intelligence, her spirit, and the quality of her retainers. He fully saw her worth, and was even willing to make her his first wife. That's an incredibly unbelievable honor for someone from such a low-ranking duchy like Aaronfest, which is only rising through the ranks right now because of mine. Heck, he even promised this girl a freaking library! My boy did his goddamn research. And not just of mine. I mean, his criticisms of Wilfried are incredibly valid. Mine is a million times more qualified to be the next Archduke, and he knows it. Back home, he can't even try to compare to her, but in the Academy, you know, he's above average. He's an honor student. So he just kind of started coasting his way through without really thinking about how he could improve, how he could better himself, how he could better the duchy. And he failed to see Mine's value, only seeing her as a problem to be contained. In fact, he's so shaken by these insults that he even gives Mine the okay to just take the offer and go. But she's not going without a fight, even saying, No game of dinner with me as a treasure will ever be lost. <laughs> to which Wilfrey replies, I will protect Rosamine, the treasure of Aaronfest, with everything I have. Everyone, lend me your power! God, such a hype moment. I love it. I absolutely freaking love it. And now that that's settled, it's time for mine to go on the counterattack, demanding that if they win, they'll get Hanalore as a prize. <laughs> Which actually rattles Leslie, and I do kind of love they like stood protectively in front of his sister like that. I mean, that's kind of cute. <laughs> Though not as cute as mine calling Hanalore her soulmate repeatedly. <laughs> And honestly, I really do like this dynamic of Mine, Wilfrey, and Hanalore all kind of running Aaron fast together. I think they'd cover each other's flaws pretty well. Anyway, though, when they get back to the dorm, and Charlotte asks, How did a simple tea party end in a dinner challenge with your engagement on the line? <laughs> to which Wilfrey replies, I now understand how you feel when people are demanding answers, but you have nothing to say. <laughs> I love it. This is such a bonding moment between them where Wilfred realizes, okay, Sometimes things go absolutely completely insane, and it's not your fault, mine. The world around you is just that freaking insane. <laughs> adorable. Absolutely lo adorable. Love it. And Harda is, you know, of the same mind. She acknowledges that this is not mine's fault, so she doesn't give them a lecture, and instead just offers advice for the match, basically replacing some of their weaker knights with uh, attendants who have way more mana. Anyway, though, then it's time for Bride Stealing Dinner, and Aaronfest is not holding back. They start with a giant washing spell to flow the enemy base, then steal their opponent's blessings, then start chucking poison detonating softballs, though those are mostly just to, you know, get them to lower their guard, before chucking deadly explosives, which themselves are basically a distraction so that Wilfried can use the God of Life sword to summon 20 Fey Beasts, 20 Lord of Winter subordinates, and while they're wrecking the Duchy, Mine gives the order to destroy all of their healing potions. A tactic that Lesley calls rents reprehensible and craven. <laughs> beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I mean, God, Ferdinand must be so proud of her right now. I really, more than anything, I want mine to tell Ferdinand about this match. <laughs> and her retainers. Honestly, the last time mine told her family about the uh, her dinner match, that was almost more entertaining than the uh, headache inducing reports. Such a great chapter. I really want to go back and read that one. And without all that said, I absolutely freaking love this sword. The Sword of the God of Life. It summons Fey Beast, equivalent to the Wheeler's total mana, and it almost wrecked the Dittardachi with Wilfried alone. Can you imagine what it'd do if mine took a swing with it? It might actually summon the real Lord of Winter. Good lord, that's an awesome power. And his chant is, you know, pretty on the nose. 
grant me the power to protect Gedruld from those who would steal her. You know, that's exactly what Wilfried is doing, keeping his wife from getting stolen. Though, that being said, the God of Life is kind of a crazy stalker who froze his wife to keep her by his side, so, you know, let's hope that's not foreshadowing. Anyway, though, in Lesla broke into Mine's windshield with a Darkness Faystone shield, a treasure of his duchy, and Mine was forced to drink an ultra nasty potion to get her strength back. <laughs> but it smelled and tasted so bad that Lesla actually thought she had poisoned herself rather than marry him. We just got above. I'm honestly not sure what to think about that. I mean, that might be, uh, that might make logical sense in the Dudachi. I honestly can't tell, but I do kind of wish mine had gone with it, being like, I'd rather die than marry you. <laughs> Thankfully, though, the po the potion uh, I was actually about to call it poison. Uh, the potion kicks in fast, and mine's able to summon Liedenschaft's spear. And while she is by no means a fighter, just kind of like swinging it around, all she needs to do is tap the shield, and it literally gets turned into gold dust, shattering the antique treasure of the duchy. <laughs> Much to Lestalette's overwhelming rage, though that's not nearly as bad as what happens next, as a bunch of students from low-ranked duchies, and even freaking sovereign knights attack the game, and the audience to take mine for themselves. For reasons. And in the confusion, Wilfried grabs Hanalore and Mine goes colorblind from overexerting herself, which is incredibly concerning, though that doesn't stop her from healing a Dittoduchi knight who falls near her. I mean, seriously, Mine is a true and complete saint. Thankfully, though, Anastasia shows up and actually does something for once, capturing the Sovereign Knight and even letting Mine return to her dorm, since he can very clearly see she's about to pass out, and he doesn't want a repeat of that one very unpleasant memory. He's also probably worried what Eglantine, he's also probably worried that Eglantine would yell at him if he made mine collapse again. Honestly, I want that to be a short story. I want uh, Anastasia's short story of him just telling Eglantine what happened with mine. That would be hilarious. Anyway, though, in the epilogue shows Handler's perspective, and despite being worried about how her duchy will react to her basically, you know, forfeiting the dinner match, Everyone supports her when they think she's in love with Wilfried, with her head attendant even complimenting her growth and being able to go after what she wants. In fact, they actually blame her brother for not realizing she was in love and was going to throw the match. Heck, Leslet even blames himself for not thinking his little sister might surpass him. Love it. So anyway, though, yeah, Hanalor is going to Erinfest, I guess. Good for her. Honestly, I'm pretty excited to see her and mine be sister wives. And then there's the short story, starting off with the Saint's Ritual. And honestly, this might be my favorite short story yet. I mean, I actually think I liked it more than the Headache and Dizzing Report chapter, which I didn't think was even possible. I mean, this chapter, from the point of view of Lorati, Muriel's love story friend from the last volume, really did just a great job of showing how others in the Academy really view mine and her ritual. And it was just this awesome, magical, holy event that left everyone in complete and utter awe. Oh. oh. Not to mention just everyone's reaction to walking into a room being like, Oh, the king is here! Okay. <laughs> beautiful. That was so utterly beautiful. Anyway, though, uh, for how people viewed mine, turns out mine was mocked quite a bit in her first year at the academy over the trend she tried to start despite being such a low-ranked duchy. At least until Anastasia bought a hairpin for Eglantine, then everyone changed their opinions and realized, Oh, this girl's a trendsetter. And then we get to the actual ritual, and while from Mine's perspective she was struggling to keep in this giant massive explosive blessing, all the Roddy and others saw was a saint who freely gave away knowledge that she could have kept for herself to benefit her own duchy, and at the end she walks away viewing Mine as a true saint, just as Hartman always said, and needs to spend a lot of time reevaluating her own common sense. <laughs> Which, you know, is pretty common when you spend too much time around Mine. There's also a few other interesting tidbits this chapter. I mean, I love that Lorati misunderstood the term cash cow and thinks it means that mine just really loves love stories and not that mine can just make a lot of money selling love stories. Uh, then when explaining the ritual, mine said that Wilfried has 12 blessings and she has 21 rather than the 43 she actually has, which is funny because 12 plus 21 is 43. 
I wonder if that was involved in a thought process. But anyway, though, this does make sense. 21 is certainly more than Wilfried, but, you know, given mine's upbringing in the temple, it only makes sense for her to have way more. Staying at 21 keeps her and Wilfried on, you know, relatively level grounds, and should hopefully keep people from comparing them too much. Also, Lorati comments that Roderick became omni-elemental, which I find interesting because I thought they were trying to keep that a secret. Very curious. I mean, I know the Smart Duchy and Aaronfest knew about it, but I don't think they would have told anyone else, especially not a lower-ranked duchy like hers. So, I'm not sure. Very, very curious. Anyway, uh, someone worthy of caution is about the princes. And like I said, the main takeaway from this is the fact that Siggy absolutely and completely sucks. And Mayan needs to deal with him before he takes the throne. Seriously, kill Siggy. Uh, Anastasia's already walked away. Just, just focus on Hildebrand. Make Hildebrand the next king. He deserves it. Anyway, that just leaves, anyway, though, that just leaves us with the Headache Inducing Report, Year 3 Chapter. <laughs> and Sylvester is already struggling with the Purge, and most of the criminals blowing themselves up, so he's more than a bit rattled when Hartman's dad shows up and says, uh, Lady Florentia fainted while reading his report. Can I ask it to handle this batch? <laughs> Seriously. I mean, the first batch, though, doesn't seem, you know, too bad. Simply saying, basically, hey, we're doing a dedication ritual and we need some spies. I mean, that'd certainly be strange for any other student to request, but that's incredibly tame by mine standards. And Sylvester is thrilled until Hartman's dad, until Hartman's dad says Hubris is a slow and insidious killer and tells him to read the back, which basically says, hey, I know you told me not to deal with the royals, but I invited all of them to join in on our dedication ritual. <laughs> oh god, poor Sylvester. Though that's somehow not as concerning as the letter Clarissa sent to Hartmint, containing her description of mine summoning the spear and her rainbow blessing, which Sylvester finds incredibly disconcerting to read, leading to Hartmint's father apologizing for being too lenient in raising him. <sighs> Good lord, I love this man. And we know that only gets worse as Sylvester learned that not only the royals, but the king himself participated in the events. Uh, mine kept out all the knights and guards, and at Mine's own account of the day, literally only mentioned her trip to the library, despite all the insanity that preceded it. <laughs> but you know, Hartman's dad tries to, him, tries to cheer him up, saying, you know, we can expect no more major incidents in the lead-up to the Interdachi tournament. <laughs> to which Sylvester sighs and says, for as long as Mine was in the academy, headache-inducing reports were inevitable. And he's not wrong. The chapter actually ends before Sylvester finds out that mine was bet on a game of dinner, despite the main volume saying that the news left both Sylvester and Florentia bedridden. <laughs> Good freaking lord, that's the report I want to see him read. Oh, love it, absolutely loved it. Anyway, there's two other things interesting this volume. Uh, first off, the Duchy of Immerdink seems to blame Mine for their troubles, so it's probably a good thing they didn't participate in the ritual, despite them being the most vocal about wanting to join in the joint research. And while all the duchies were struggling to qualify for the ritual and play dinner against the dear duchy, Mine relaxed with some books, happy for the first time in a long time. God, this girl is savage, and I love it. Uh, mine also invented graphs and charts this volume, as that's apparently not a thing in this world, but Mine invented it. Very curious to see how people react to that, especially the smart duchy. I mean, this is for the Ditter Duchy research, so I doubt anyone's going to think they thought it up. They're probably going to imagine it was definitely Mine's idea. <laughs> and I'm sure, like, next year's uh, Interdutch Tournament will see a lot of charts and graphs, and they'll just become the norm with everyone copying Mind, the trendsetter. And Mine also makes a comments volume, which I find interesting, saying you know, when she gets pregnant and has kids down the road, which was... Kinda unexpected. I mean, Sylvester himself seemed unsure if that was even possible, given how sickly she was. But I guess she's willing to give it a shot with her brother. Good for her, I guess. Though that's... Yeah, that's gonna be awkward. That's gonna be really freaking awkward. And finally, Frau Alarm insisted on wearing gloves before taking a letter from Mine, so she definitely, so she's definitely in the know about the plan to poison Mine, and still thinks it went off without a hitch. Though that said, this is either a crazy dangerous poison if it can still be spread by touch months later, or Fralarm is just completely and absolutely insane. Probably the latter, honestly. And uh, yeah, those are my thoughts on this volume. I thought this would be a shorter video, so I was only focusing on like the highlights, the main events, but uh, yeah, I've been talking for 46 minutes. <laughs> I'm assuming the actual video is going to be closer to 35, let's say. Yeah, first five minutes were a bit rough, though. Let's say 35 minutes. That's my bet. 
Uh, anyway, though, please let me know anything down below. Uh, how would mine do in the Dudachi? I mean, yeah, she doesn't really care about Ditter, but they have really, really big libraries, and she is pretty good at coming up with strategies, so she would actually fit in there really well. I just caught above. Her having the actual authority to do what she already does now, to actually negotiate, to actually bargain with royals. Oh, that would be amazing. That would be so completely and absolutely amazing. I love that. Uh, how do you think Hanalore is going to do in Arenfest? I mean, let's not forget, Veronica's mother moved in from a greater duchy to, to marry the Archduke, and she was met with a lot of resistance from the Lice Gang faction, who well and truly hated her. So, I may mean, hope that wouldn't happen to Hanalore, but that's definitely something to consider. Uh, also, uh, why did the Sovereign Knights attack the game? I mean, they said it was to keep mine safe because the Royals wanted mine safe, but the Royals didn't actually tell them to do it. So, weird. Very, very weird. But anyway, though, please let me think down below. And until next time, peace!